<clears throat> so Egypt is and stands for us here as an example of two primary truths that we want to see. I want to, uh, it's been my prayer for you this week as I've read the text and studied the text and have attempted to write uh, upon the text in this manner. I see that, 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 that there are two, at least these two primary truths. It's not that this is the only truthful thing that's in the chapter, but two things that I want us to aim at in the process of examining this nation and the oracle concerning this nation. First of all, it is this, that, that God is long-suffering and full of mercy. I want you to see that. I, I want, when, I, when, when we walk through the, this oracle and we see the, the lament that lays upon this nation, I want you to see the long-suffering nature of God. I want you to see His mercy toward them. And then... Almost as though in contrast, I want you to see the swiftness of God's judgment. These two, stand, these two stand as a paradox before us. They stand even as a juxtaposition, two ideas that how is it possible for this to be true and this to be true at the same time. And it has been my prayer this week that clarity will come in both the speaking and in the hearing that we would see God as a long-suffering, merciful mighty God in this respect, and also then that we would see God is swift in His judgment. Do you see the, the problem that, that the mind has with this? How can, how can God both be long-suffering and swift? How can He be long-suffering in His mercy and swift in His judgment at the same time? Do they not stand opposed to each other? Well, perhaps a series of questions and a series of observations along the way will help Help us to see that. And likely you already have a working answer toward this, even from Isaiah chapter 19, or even from the totality, the whole of Scripture itself. Can you, can you stop for a moment and think? How, how, how often do you hear people in our day talk about this Old Testament God? He's full of hate and rage. He's full of judgment. He's just always destroying this and, 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 destroying, and destroying this people or that person with his judgment. He's so full of hate. Give me the God of the New Testament who's full of mercy and love and long-suffering, peaceful. I want you to see something here in this reputation that the culture has given to the way God is looked at from the pages of the Old Testament. I do not make an argument that we're looking at two different gods or that we're looking at a God that has even changed in the way He behaves or thinks. We don't have an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. We don't have a way that God behaves in the Old Testament and a way that God behaves in the New Testament. We have a God, Almighty, Jehovah, Almighty, Yahweh. This is the God of the Bible and we see as much long-suffering and mercy from God in chapter 19 as we see swift judgment upon those who have offended God. We see them both here. First of all, let's keep this in mind. What nation... Obviously, we, we already know a storied relationship between God's people and the Babylonians, but we cannot forget the ancient, the historic relationship that God's people have with the nation of Egypt. And it is a long relationship. It is one filled with good and one filled with bitterness. It is one filled with fear and terror. It is one filled with blessedness. So it is 16 centuries. When you look at, at the storyline or the, the, the timeline of the relationship between God's people and the nation of Egypt. It is, a, it is as long of a relationship as you will find in Scripture. But, but consider for a minute, <clears throat> I have about 12 or 15 things that the Bible explicitly says and warns concerning the activity of the nation of Egypt. So when, when, I, when I lay these things out, keep this in mind in comparison to the long-suffering, merciful behavior of God toward this nation. 
His, his mercy has been indeed seen. The nation of Egypt is known for her various idolatry. Now, we have pictures and snapshots of it here in chapter 19. Uh, we, we, and we'll pick those up along the way. We also know just from the history, we know this from ancient, both biblical as well as outside of biblical narratives, that the nation of Egypt is, is tangled up in, in, in worship of man, particularly her king or her pharaoh. Uh, the, the worship, king worship or pharaoh worship. And we know that this stands opposed to the law of God, where God instructs His people, you are to worship no one but God and God alone. We know this about the nation of Egypt, that they are dabblers of demonic activity. They are, they are, they are, they are participators of sorcery, of, of evil, mystical, uh, dangerous things that God warns His people to have nothing to do with. But the nation, the ancient nation of, of Egypt is entangled. It is even, the bedrock of it is built upon this sorcery, this mystical incantations of, of calling forth demonic spirits. The nation of Egypt is known in the ancient world as a nation that, that kidnaps slaves, go to other places and brings them in. Not only that, but they also... This is particularly the truth for the, for the nation of Israel. But they also welcome outsiders in only to turn on them eventually and make them slaves. And their treatment of slaves is of the cruelest kind. They're, 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 this is not a place to make an argument for or against slavery. The reality here is the treatment of anyone in the nation of Egypt that are not native-born Egyptians is of the cruelest kind. There certainly is some uh, freedoms that travelers will have, but if owned by the nation of Egypt, the treatment is uh, at times good, and then whenever it, it appears as though their treatment, their, their treating of the, of the lowest people in their, in their society, as they've deemed it, poses it to be a threat to them, everything changes. And we know that particularly true with their treatment of the, uh, of the Israelites. We know that their, their relationship is inside of the, the nation, the morality of the Egyptians is plagued with all kinds of impurity. They're, they're an indecent people, the ancient Egyptians. Their morality worsens, which is true, by the way, if you look at anyone who does not stop the path that they're currently on, they will, they will perpetually, increasingly, maybe subtly, maybe oh so slowly, but they will be on a worsening trajectory toward worsening of their morality. I've already mentioned their sorcery activity and dabbling, but outright demonic affections. The ancient Egyptians are known for this. If you look specifically at, the, at their treatment of God's people, they are kind in the early days, and then they forget why they're kind to them, and they become oppressive to them. Uh, the, the story of the book of Exodus is essentially the story of that shift, of the kindness that, that Egypt has toward one particular individual, Joseph, that once Joseph dies, a generation passes and the nation forgets the kindness that they've expressed toward this people in days past and they become oppressive. So oppressive that even in the first chapter of Exodus that we, ha that we have knowledge about their first attempt of exterminating the entirety or the, the, the increasing of the male, the strength, the power of the Israelites. And that's where God sends uh, the kindness to, to, to His people to save out of this extermination attempt the kindness of God upon them by saving Moses, God's elected redeemer of the people out of slavery. So there is, they're an oppressive people to God's people. They've, attempt, they've attempted 
multiple times of extermination, but certainly their assault against the, the children, two years and younger, especially and specifically of the male children. Their increasing ill treatment of God's people is storied throughout the book of Exodus as they demand same production of product with less resources. And it's, a, it's an ill treatment against God's people. They, 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 they are sought, at, the Egyptians seek to destroy the entire nation on the borders of the Red Sea after God has delivered them, God brings them to the borders of the Red Sea, the Egyptian army is fast on their trail to exterminate them and to, and to completely obliterate them from the face of the earth. But God again restores them or saves them and rescues them from that attempt. There is a plundering of the nation of Israel under the rule of Rehoboam. You remember during the divided kingdom era, the first king of the southern kingdom, Rehoboam, one of Solomon's sons, there is an attempt to, uh, to, to, to plunder the nation of, of Israel, uh, specifically the city of Jerusalem. They come and they basically raid the temple and rob it of all of its pre treasures and of all of its jewels and all of its wealth. It's an, they've, so they've, they, they, they have a long storied att attempted attacks against them. And then later on, the, the nation of Egypt will get into a, 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 an allied force with the Assyrians and the kinsmen of the southern kingdom, Israel. They will attempt even a, a, another military strategy attempt to attack God's people. And so, can I just say from that, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a large block of ancient history time of a people acting against God. And this nation, Egypt, is allowed prosperity, strength. They're known throughout all of the world for her, for her treasures, for her kings, for her army. I would say here, this is an example of a long-suffering relationship that this nation has with God. People who want to accuse God of being hateful and judging. They want to put wrong definitions to the way that they would describe God. Have completely forgotten to, to, to examine the history that the Bible poses for us of the way that God has behaved toward Egypt. Before the nation of Egypt. Patient, long-suffering. He has judged her. He has brought hardship upon her, no doubt. But he has not completely removed them. And we see from the pages of chapter 19 that God even intends to send a Savior to them, which is an act of mercy, long-suffering. Don't tell me of an Old Testament Yahweh who's different than a New Testament Yahweh who's, who's behaving with grace and mercy. Don't talk to me about this kind of a description of this God, unless you're willing to address the nation of Egypt with me. Look at her, examine her, see completely God's mercy and His grace that He has extended to me. Now yes, God will act swiftly. He tells us this even in the very first verse of chapter 19. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. So we know not only has God been very long-suffering and full of mercy toward this nation, He is also certain and swift in His judgment upon her. The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, verse 31, that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Egypt should have known this. Of all nations that had interaction with God's people, Egypt is without excuse. Egypt could not stand at any point and say, God has dealt unfairly with us, this ancient nation. So God brings out, he, he sends civil war upon the nation is what he will eventually do here in Isaiah chapter 19. You see that 
Essentially, in verse number one, is the idols of Egypt, when God shows up, they even will tremble. These, these deaf, mute lumps of rock, they will tremble in the presence of God. And the hearts of the Egyptians will melt within them when God shows himself swift. Verse number two begins to show how God will deal with them and how he will send them into chaos. He will do so by inciting civil war within the nation. Now, I don't know if you're a student of our own nation's civil war, but if you just, if you just become a historian for a moment and think about what it's like when a nation is in civil war, it is an unpleasant, it is the most unpleasant time for all citizens when a nation is in civil war. And this is what God is doing with the nation of Israel or the nation of Egypt here in Isaiah chapter 19. You think about it whenever you study and when you become a historian for a moment and you read about what it's like in nations that are in civil war, there, there is a great burden upon the nation. Think of it. Is there ever a good thing there may be good results that come out of civil war, and we can certainly see the benefits of it that came in our own nation's civil war. But in the moment of, of the outbreak, is there anything good in anyone's eye that this is a good day to be in? There is no nation that's saying, finally, we get to have our own civil war. No nation wants for it. No nation plans for it. It's in that time of civil war that everything, I mean literally everything is disturbed. In Isaiah chapter 19, we're told that city will rise up against city. Egyptian will rise up against Egyptian. Brother will rise up against brother. Neighbor against neighbor. City against city and region and Region against region, the spirit of the Egyptians will be completely, in verse number three, will be completely demoralized within them. Their economy is ruined. There's no reasonable voices during this time. And any reasonable voice that is heard in a time of civil war isn't heard because there is a rowdiness about the voices that are present. This is, this is the devastation of civil war. Upon a nation. Now, at the end of it, there may be a movement that God is using for His good and for His glory. He is doing so for His glory and for His good. But in the moments of it, in the throes of it, there is nobody living that is saying, finally, we get to have civil war. No, this is no good day. And Egyptian, Egypt is tasting this hardship as they are at this very moment in, in this unfolding of Isaiah's descriptions. What else will he do? He will also rise up a decay. <clears throat> this is strange because they're already a nation that is crippled with sorcery and idolatry and dabblings in demonic activity. So it's not that, that this next verse is necessarily, or that the end of verse number three is necessarily introducing new things but I think really what it is showing us here is that which has been perpetually going on in the nation of, Is uh, in the nation of Egypt will now become the ext extraordinarily normal activity. Where, where They will consult the idols. They will not turn to God during this moment. They'll even, they'll even resort to incantations of dead spirits. They, they, they will cut themselves. They will, they will bleed themselves. They will sacrifice their own, their own kind. They will give themselves over into mediums and spiritists. They will, they will drug themselves so that they can see and hear and, and, and experience things that they never could, perhaps trying to escape the problems and the hardships of what has come of the civil war rather than turn to God in the, in the early moments. What will they do? They will turn inward and they will resort to the way that they have behaved all along. So there's, there's a dangerous observation that I, I, I would want you to not miss as we examine these pages. Think of it, think of it, nations, there's no good day for a nation to be in civil war, but I want you to think of this not just in nations. I want you to think of this even in your own household. There is no good day in any household 
when husband and wife are at odds with each other. There is no good day when that's happening. Maybe that's the course even for you right now, but you know, it's, you know there's no part of that day that you're thinking, I wake up today and I think, I hope I get to have a, a disagreement with my spouse today. If you're thinking like that, first of all, you need to stop thinking like that. But nobody, nobody engages in a marital relationship thinking, I pray for nothing but perpetual hardship. Now you might get perpetual hardship, but that's not what you pray for. What you pray for is that God will, in the hardships, reveal Himself to you as a reliable source to lean into. Think of it. Have you ever heard of churches that have wars with each other? And they fight about the silliest of things. But yet, you know, if you were in that church or if you were in that moment, you would think it to be the most important thing of the world. What a great tragedy it would be that God would set church member against church member, attender against attender, worshiper against worshiper. God doesn't just do that for kicks. There would have to be a reason why God would want to bring civil dis disruption to what otherwise appears to be prosper prosperity and of great comfort. Think of it not only in relationship to nations and churches and families. Think of it about the, think of it even so. Now, I'm not suggesting that you, you need to start living in suspicion about the people who are in this very room with you. But can you imagine a day that selfishness and, and pride ruled each individual's hearts so much so that we would be willing to run over and crush those who disagree with us. Now that's not to, min that's not to make light of instructions in the New Testament that address false theologies and, 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 and false preachers. You have to deal with them swiftly. You have to deal with them. The, the New Testament gives us instructions. They have to be dealt with. You can't ignore them. But can you imagine, while a people are in the the process of worshiping God, that at the same time, it could not be possible for that at the same time for there to be enmity against each other. So where there is strife in a church, where there is strife in a family, where there is strife in a nation, it is likely because there is a spiritual matter that really is at the core of it. It's not an economy matter. It's not a political party matter. It's a spiritual matter. Remember that in our own nation. Remember that in our own city. Remember that in our own church. Remember that in your family. At the core of this is something that needs to be dealt with that is spiritual in essence. And so God brings this upon this nation because they have behaved in the way that they have unfairly and unjustly before God. Furthermore, you see that the, the impacts upon this are both natural as well as supernatural. It's economically, it has an economical impact. It has an industrial impact. It has a, an impact upon civilization as we know it. And that's what verses 5 through 10 uh, and, and 5 through 13 really just kind of unfold this. And, and I won't dig out all of these here, but notice and see them that there are impacts upon their natural resources, the rivers, the impact upon the canals, that which they've brought and that which they've designed to bring life to the desert floor now is a source of, as verse number six even calls it, of a, 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 it's a now that which used to, used to give the aroma of life and spring. You know what spring smells like? Can you imagine spring smelling like a dead skunk? That's what's happened to the natural resources. The industry is completely dried up in verses 6 and 7. That which they've been able to accomplish and that which they've, they've harvested and made into a, a, a vibrant economy is now even 
being completely ruined in verse 7, 8, and 9. And then it even, it even points back to verse 2 where the civil war is, uh, description is being showed to us. But even verse 9 and 10 shows us even more of the impact upon the civilization as a whole. And that is that the pillars of Egypt itself will be crushed. Now keep in mind we're talking about the ancient nation of Egypt. The nation of Egypt... There is still, you go pull out a geopolitical map and you'll see the nation of Egypt. Right there it is. That big nation on the northeast quadrant of the continent of Africa. It's still present and still to some degree is largely can be argued has some pockets of economic strength. But as a whole, not so much. But these are descriptions that are being given to an ancient people. Not the modern uh, civilization as we know Egypt to be now. This impact has come clearly upon her. What will come in the following verses will be the kindness of God. While God has brought this hardship upon her because of the way she has treated him and his people. Verse 14 begins the painting of this. The, the Lord, no, notice, notice, and I haven't really mentioned this along the way, but certainly it becomes a, a prominent fixture here in the, in the remaining verses, who the, who the active agent is in all of this. We can go back and pick up phrases inside of the previous 13 verses, and you'll see it's the Lord who did this. The Lord brought this in. The Lord, the, it is the Lord who has done this, and we see that continuing in this in verse number 14. The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of distortion, and, and they have led Egypt astray in all that it does as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. There will be no work for Egypt, which its head or tail, its palm branch or bulrush may do. That shows the complete obliteration of the economy and the civilization of ancient Egypt. Now notice in verse 16, is again a familiar phrase that we've seen throughout the book of Isaiah is a statement of time. It's in that day. So it doesn't say after that day, but it's in that day. While judgment is swiftly coming upon the nation of Egypt, in that day the Egyptians will become like women. And that's not to demean men or women. That's just to describe that this is the, the way that a nation that once was known for being a powerful, mighty military force, as well as an economic impact upon, impactor upon all of the world, now, she is, now the nation has become like a weak, fearful, timid, trembling woman who's over in the corner biting all of her nails off. And that's just to use the illustration of that. It's, not to dis, not, it's no description that that's the way women are. It's the description of how that would be if this were the one over in the week. You could say, in the same sense, that like a, like a weak man who's biting his nails over in the corner. But the, we don't want to weaken the, the, the text of Scripture. I'm saying that just in the sense that we're, this isn't Scripture picking on women. This is God using this description to make a serious point to you. The nation is defenseless, has no military strength whatsoever has no financial strength at all. So she has become like this. This is how it is in this day. It's how the nation of Israel is being described, the, na the nation of Egypt is being described. And it will mention in verse 17, the land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. And prior to this, Egypt has been attempting to exterminate Judah since the days she left Egypt in, in the Exodus. But now, where before the nations in Canaan were fearful of God's people coming because they heard of the reputation of Yahweh, now it is the nation of Egypt who has turned back on her heels and living in terror of the people who bear the name Yahweh. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it. This is the purpose of the Lord. Notice who the acting agent. This is God doing this on purpose for a reason. And he's doing so and he's acting against the nation of Egypt. Now this is where 
where, where people want to pick up this idea of an angry God. No, He's a living God, and He is the supreme almighty God. So it's not arrogant for Him to call all people to worship Him and to worship no other gods. It's actually loving of Him because men are designed by God to be worshipers of God. And we're not, when we're not worshiping Yahweh, we will find something else to worship. That is the way, that is our nature. We, if, we, if we're not worshiping Almighty God, which shows us the kindness of God, that He would give us a revelation of who He is and what He, what he wants from us. It is a kindness of Him that He would do this for us. And so now, everything has changed for the nation of Egypt. Verse 18 is another use of that phrase, in that day. So in that day, where the Lord is riding as a swift cloud, and He will come to Egypt, and He will create this kind of chaos within the nation. It's in that day, the five cities in the land of Egypt, this is verse 18, will be speaking the language of Canaan. Now it's interesting that Isaiah used the word Canaan rather than Israel. It's to speak of the larger region in its totality as well as the historic relationship that Egypt has had with Canaan in days past. But now they're speaking the language of Canaan. And notice what they're doing. They're swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One of these cities will be called the city of... Some translations call this the city of sun, or the city of light, the city of destruction. This is what light does to darkness, is it destroys it. And one of these five cities that is now giving her allegiance to Yahweh is now known as the city of light. Out of this city, of the people that have devoted themselves out of their leadership, the spiritual leadership in this community, that it is the Lord God Almighty who is the God of gods. He's the, he is the Lord of all lords. He is the one, the only one that we should be giving our allegiance to. And it is out of this city that news, that the gospel, that hope is being spoken. And it is referred to as the city of light. The city of the sun. The city of destruction. Because it is destroying the work of of darkness, of, of, of night. Verse 19 is further instructions about that day. It's in that day, again, in the day where the Lord is riding like a swift cloud of judgment after centuries of mercy. It's in that day. There will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its borders. And it will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and He will send them a Savior and a champion, and He will deliver them. So, when all of the world wants to point about the swift, or the, the hatred of God, and the judgment of God, and the cruelty of God, you know what they really want? They, they want to give all characteristics to God to one day. In that day where He comes swiftly, they, all, they want to describe Him from that day and they want to ignore His long patient, His long suffering patience prior to this and they want to ignore His mercy in the days to come. This is the, this is the way the world wants to look at the God of the Bible. I say to you, church, don't let them, don't give them reason to believe like this. Take them to Scripture and show them the way that God behaves with nations. He does judge them for their sin, but He behaves long-suffering and He behaves full of mercy toward them. And He promises them a Savior. He promises them a champion. He promises them that He Himself will deliver them. <clears throat> Verse 21, Thus the Lord will make Himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They'll know Him in the day when He brings His judgment. They'll see His mercy. They'll see His long-suffering. They'll see His kindness. You know, it's the New Testament that says 
that the, that, that the judgment of God is, is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And it is in this day when God's judgment is upon them that God behaves kindly at the same moment toward them. So, there will be places that will be erected that once were places that, were, that gave homage to all other gods that you could imagine. But now, the name of Yahweh is being spoken from cities, spoken from individuals. So, verse 22, the Lord will strike Egypt. Striking, notice this, but healing. So they, and, and the reason why he strikes them is the reason that he heals them is that they may return to the Lord and that he will respond to them and he will heal them. This is a work to not destroy, but rather it is a chastening. It is a work to discipline. It is a work to restore. It is a work to heal. Verse 23, in that day, again, another reference to this, what would otherwise be seen as a hard, difficult day. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And this, this is interesting because the Assyrians are known for their amalgamating behavior of all gods. The Assyrians were the kind of people that decided, you know what, we're not going to declare a national god. We're just going to, we're going to be known as the tolerant ones. But they're... They too defined the word tolerant and meaning go ahead and believe any God you want to. And as a matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and say this God and this God have a, have, have a lot in common. And so let's worship both of them at the same time. But that tolerance in that day is much like today. You go ahead and worship any God you want to, but don't, don't you believe in this God of the Bible? It's the only God that the world is, toler is intolerant for. Worship any God you want, and the world applauds you. But worship the God of the Bible, today the world hates you. You know this, you experience this. You experience it in your neighborhoods. You're experiencing it right now on a national level. You're experiencing this as laws and as that which historically would never have been and, and gone to where we've gone are now not only embraced, celebrated, but promoted. And how does that happen but by an intolerant people toward the only God who can restore them and heal them and forgive them? It is a stubborn people that would behave like this. But interesting here that God gives Egypt this moment to be a flicker of light and in a place where worship of Yahweh is established that He also gives them an economic highway to Assyria. And then verse 24, another reference to this same day, he will also bring in the whole of this third party, the nation, the people, not just the northern kingdom, Israel, but the people of God. Verse 25 shows this, that whom the Lord of hosts has blessed. And he's, he's saying this of Egypt. Egypt, my people. Now that's interesting because you know, all people in the Old Testament would have said God's people are Israel. But God declares Egypt is my people. He, he makes a declaration, and I think this declaration is very specific. It's not, it's not to speak of the nation as its national identity. It's to speak of these people in Egypt who have turned to God. I have people in Egypt, and they belong to me. They are my people. It's in that sense that that is true, and it's also in this sense that God used the national, the geopolitical, ancient history ancient historical nation of Egypt, he used that people to direct God's people, Israel. So God can say, Egypt, my people, and not be inaccurate. He can also say of the nation of Assyria who hated God, who hated Yahweh, who hated God's people, 
he can say about her, he can say about this nation Assyria that they are the work of my hands. Earlier in this chapter, you're, you're reminded of, a, of an action that God does when he whistles or he waves his hands to the north. This is some of Isaiah's prophecies that he will... That, that God Himself turns to the north and He waves His hand. In other words, He gives them the signal. Okay, Assyria, come on in and take my people captive. Who's the acting agent here? It's not the king of Assyria. It's Almighty God that says, now is your time. Come and do what I've created you to do. All of this created world is God's. Now it's Israel is in the blessed position of being the inheritance of God. Egypt is my people. I've used them. They are mine. I've, I've brought them in. I've judged them. I've, I, I have stricken them. And I have saved them. They're my people. Assyria, they've done my work. They hate me. But that wasn't my concern. The reality is they did my work. But now Israel, this people, they are my inheritance. They are the bearers of my name. When we make application of this in a moment, we're not here to make an argument between ancient Israel and modern America as being one and the same. We're, we're not talking that kind of nonsense. We're talking about professors of the name of God by the work, the sufficient work of Jesus Christ, by faith alone, and it is by God's grace alone that you have called out to God and declared Him your God. You are, by, by definition of the New Testament, you've been grafted into the inheritance. You are part of that people who will inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is the way that God works with all nations. Now, we sit back now and make application upon this. What in the world do we make of this? What are you saying about our own nation? What are you saying about our church? What are you saying about my family? Am I, am I God's people or am I just God's hand? Am I part of the inheritance? I would say, out of any of the descriptions in verse 25, you would want to concern yourself with that. Am I part of the inheritance? To say that you are God's people is not the same as saying we're all God's children which is what most of the world wants to say about all of humanity in a relationship to God. We can literally say we are God's people because we are created by God to give glory to God and God does what He wants with people for His glory. But this people who bear my name, they are my inheritance. It doesn't make you a special person does it make you smarter than anyone else? It really ought to throw you on the floor in humility and embarrassment of the arrogant ways we walk before God. Israel is my inheritance. All nations, we're not, we, we, we must not walk here saying that only the nation of Israel belongs to God. No, no. It is clear all nations belong to God. They are His to do as He wants. Not all nations respect God, this is clear, but all nations belong to God. Do you see this here? Do you see this in this oracle against the nation of Israel? Do you see this, that from this oracle, when God comes to a nation, he is either a judge of this nation or is he is either saving her in the descriptions that we see of Isaiah chapter 19. God certainly brings a savior to the nation of Egypt. It's not a different savior. It's not another savior different than how he saves those who are in Israel or those who are in Africa or those who are in Russia or those who are in China or those who are in South America or those who are in America. It is the one, the same Almighty God Himself. He sends His only begotten Son to save the people. And, and the book of Revelation shows us that there will, be, there will be people from all nations. 
all tribes, all languages. All, there will be people from everywhere who are part of this inheritance. When God comes, you should pay attention. Has He, has he come in patience? Has He come in long-suffering? Has He come in judgment? Has He come in mercy? Has He come to you in your circumstances today? Are, are, you, are, you, are you hearing the oracle of Egypt with ears of a, of a spiritual mind thinking upon the way God works with people? Are you here today seeing God as being long-suffering with you? You know, you know full and well because God has implanted this upon your heart that there is a God. The Bible reveals this to us in the book of Romans and it reveals this throughout all of Scripture. But what have you done with this God? Have you, have you behaved arrogantly and you've not submitted yourself to Him? Oh, I would say to you today, look back on your day and you'll notice God has behaved long-sufferingly with you. He has been very patient with your arrogant, godless ways, hasn't He? He has been an enduring God. He has put up with many shenanigans that you have put on. He has dealt with your placating patiently. He has dealt with your pretenses kindly. You might find yourself today God visiting you in a moment of hardship. You might find yourself like the nation of Israel where God has come swiftly to judge because you know there is a God and you've acted arrogantly before Him. And, and the moment you're in right now is like a civil war, isn't it? There is no pleasant place for you. What will you do today? What will you do in that moment? Will you fight in your arrogant stance? Or will you humble yourself today and call upon Christ as your Savior? as your champion. Will you give yourself to Him today? Do not remain as the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews would describe the nation of Israel so often in the day of their rebellion, their stubbornness, their stiff-neckedness. Do not behave like that. No, in this day, behave like one humbled because of the kindness of God. You deserve his full judgment. And look, He's behaved very kindly towards you in His long suffering. When God comes to your family, when God comes to a church, when God comes to you, when God comes to a nation, we're reading in Isaiah 19 a way, the way that God deals with His people amongst ungodly people. He deals with nations and He judges them and He saves His people in their midst. When God comes in judgment, no one can say that was unfair of God. When God comes in judgment, all the writers of the New Testament make this very clear. Every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Oh, you are God. You are Almighty God. Do not wait for to be forced to say that in the judgment. But rather today, hear the appeal of your Redeemer, of your Savior. Hear the appeal of God. Hear the mercy of God. Hear His kindness today, won't you? Now to the believer, I want your eyes to be fixed upon and I want you to notice verses 24 and 25 in relationship to this people who are of the inheritance. Those who are the the God-fearing followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear this clearly. This is not just a, an appeal to the unconverted to repent and to turn to Christ. This is an appeal to you, you God-fearers. Be certain that you, that you remain steadfast while judgment comes to your nation. A God-fearing person will be a blessing wherever he goes. Now, I didn't say he'll be well-liked everywhere he goes. But a God-fearing person will be a blessing everywhere he goes. Do you see that God includes the nation of Israel? Not, not her geopolitical nation, 
but he includes her as a God-fearing people. That he has included Israel as the ones who will be recipients of the inheritance. Do you, see, do you see this in the pages here? Do you see this in the oracle concerning the nation of Egypt? That God, that God will, will, not only he, he will act swiftly upon the nation that sins against Him, but what a blessedness to that same nation that God would plant God-fearing people in that nation. Can you think of it like this, church? Your, your, your place of employment. I, I pray, I, it, may, it may be a very hard place for you to go. You may not... You may not wake up thinking, I can't wait to get to work today. But can I encourage you to, to begin thinking differently than the people that you work with? Can I encourage you to begin thinking like a God-fearer? That God has placed you where you are for the purpose of being a displayer of His glory. And you go there with great desire to be a God-fearer, to devote all of your attention to being a blessing to that employer who has employed you. I mean, this is the language of the New Testament, isn't it? Do all, both in Galatians and Ephesians, and about four different places in the New Testament, we see that the, that the Word of God instructs us that whatever your hands find to do, do as though you're doing for the Lord. Will you not take advantage of the workhouse as a place of displaying the glory of God? There, there may be a lot of immoral activity going in that workplace. Some of the places that you have to work are difficult, aren't they? They're hard. There's a lot of immorality. There's a lot of talk that's not right. There's a lot of activity that is, that is in the face of God completely offending Him. But what would it be like if tomorrow every person from Eastside Baptist Church who bears the name of Christ showed up at the workplace and worked as though they were working for God. What kind of impact would that have? What kind of impact would that have, moms and dads? If all of your activity for your children was to raise your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, what would happen if you raised your children the way God's Word instructed you, not the way the temporal moment wants to lead you? What would happen in our homes? What would happen in our nation? What would happen in this community itself? Can you see that here? Do you remember? Can I, can I take you back to that, that first moment when the nation of Israel and Egypt begin their storied relationship? Do you remember that, that boy, Joseph? His brothers sold him into slavery. Those traitors took him to Egypt and sold him to the Egyptians. Now you know this, that Joseph didn't live all of his days in Egypt as a championed little orphan boy who his brothers sold him into slavery. He lived many hard days in this land. He spent many days, many years, forgotten in a dungeon. But because he was a God-fearer, honored God, was truthful and fair in his dealings. He was recognized and remembered and then established and placed in a place of great prominence while God was, was bringing his people to the nation of Egypt for deliverance. Remember, the Bible talks about this massive, many would argue nearly global of the inhabited world's famine. And what had God done but established through what man intended for wrong and evil, God intended for good by putting Joseph in this nation. And Joseph warned the Pharaoh of Egypt, we need to prepare for hard days. And it's not so that Egypt can prosper, but it's because God's people will need food one day. And God, God will use this godless nation, this God-hating nation, to save His people. And God will do so through a God-fearing man. He, he's proven this to do through God-fearing women of the Bible. God, this is the way God works in nations. Is He preserves a God-fearing people to be a blessing to nations that hate Him. Oh church, you... 
You know this, don't you? You're living in a nation that is increasingly, progressively becoming more and more of a God-hater than she's ever been before. Oh, that God would give the God-hating nation of our own homeland a God-fearing people. Oh, dear Eastside Baptist Church, do you see how serious the day is? Boys and girls, when you go to those schoolhouses, you're not there to just get an education. You're there to be a God-fearing walker before the Lord God Almighty. Are you doing so? Or are you being influenced by the culture that hates God? Moms and dads, pay close attention to this. Give biblical instruction in this matter. And then don't think just because you don't send your children to the schoolhouse that your children are, are immune from this. Be even perhaps more careful. Because subtly the enemy, he hates you and he hates your children so much that he will even let you be in the idea of thinking you're in a safe place while all the way the enemy com continues to decay and crumble that which you think is safe and secure. Live like a God-fearer in this God-hating day.